Hi, welcome to the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago's virtual tour. My name is Justin Brown. I'm a public affairs specialist here and I'll be your tour guide today. The Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago is a government agency responsible for treating wastewater and managing stormwater for the Chicago region. So that means cleaning sewage and working to reduce flooding in the area. Even though we have the word water in our name, one thing we're not responsible for is the region's water supply. For most people in our service area, their water comes from the City of Chicago's Department of Water Management. We were founded in 1889 to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you how we did that and maybe more importantly, why it was necessary to do that. Today, we have seven wastewater treatment plants, including our Egan plant in Schaumburg, where I am now. We have hundreds of miles of sewers. We have flood control and green infrastructure projects all across the county. And we have a system of huge tunnels, hundreds of feet underground that flow into gigantic reservoirs that are designed to protect our rivers from sewer overflows. So I'm gonna be showing you all that and more actually. Um, one of my other job duties here besides giving tours is shooting photos and video. So a lot of what I'll be showing you is stuff that I've seen firsthand. And I'm gonna to try to share with you what I think are the coolest, most interesting and informative views of our work. So we'll see stuff from the air, shot from helicopters and drones, from ground level, both on land, but also out on the river on our boats. I'll take you through the wastewater treatment process, starting with where the water flows into the plant, and we'll follow it step by step through that process. And that'll include some underwater views and some microscopic views. Then we'll go 300 feet underground and uh, check out the deep tunnel system. I'll show you how it was built and how it works. After that, we'll come back up to the surface and join our biologists for some electrofishing on the river. Finally, to round everything out, we'll see a huge explosion of 36,000 tons of limestone getting blasted out during excavation at one of our reservoirs. So um, that's the plan. Let's get going. Our first stop is about 40 miles north of Chicago at Illinois State Beach Nature Preserve. Now this is a really interesting spot because historians say that the landscape here is similar to the way the landscape originally was in Chicago. The Nature Preserve has a river running through it and so this is kind of the closest thing we have to a time machine to be able to go back and check out the original Chicago River. While we're here, I want you to notice a couple things. First, the banks of the river are not very well defined. You can see water extending into these grasses here. And actually when I shot this video, my feet ended up getting wet where I was standing. The second thing is the top surface of the water is very close in elevation to the surrounding landscape. So what that means is when it rains here, the river tends to spread out and flood a wide area. The Chicago River today is a lot different. We're on the main stem downtown and you can see for one thing, the banks are now very well defined. In fact, in some places there are even buildings like the Wrigley Building here, built right up to the edge of the water. The river itself is also wider and deeper and the top surface of the water is now significantly lower in elevation than the surrounding landscape. There's one more thing that's important that you can't see here, and that is that the flow of the river has been reversed, so it no longer flows into Lake Michigan. Today, it flows away from the lake, and I'm gonna show you how that was done to protect the lake from pollution and to provide drainage for the region. Here's an illustration of Chicago in 1820. You can see the North Branch, the South Branch, and the main stem of the Chicago River flowing out into Lake Michigan here. The artist even showed some areas where the banks of the river are not very well defined, which I think look familiar. They look like what we just saw at Illinois State Beach Nature Preserve. This is maybe at Clark Street or Dearborn here. The city grew quickly. By 1857, we had a population of 93,000. And in 1868, we had the busiest port in the world on the Chicago River. Chicago began work on a sewer system in the 1850s. This is a map of the beginnings of that. And it would actually go on to become the first comprehensive sewer system in the United States. The sewers were designed to do two things, to provide drainage for rainwater and to carry sanitary sewage from homes and businesses straight into the river. 
wastewater treatment technology didn't exist. So at the time, the best bet was to put it in the river and dilute it and hope for the best. This is a sort of simplified illustration of the Chicago landscape. So originally the Chicago River flowed out into Lake Michigan, like you see here. Now I wanna point out one thing that will seem really obvious, but it's important to keep in mind as we uh, continue the story here. And that is that water likes to flow downhill. You'll notice here that the area that the Chicago River is flowing through is very flat. And it's also at a similar elevation to the lake. So since the river doesn't have much of a hill to go down, it tends to go very slowly. Also, just like the river at Illinois State Beach Nature Preserve, the top surface of the water is at a similar elevation to the surrounding landscape. So that means when it rained, the river would spread out and flood a wide area. And that's where they built Chicago. The city's sewer system helped to provide some drainage, and it also introduced that sanitary sewage to the river, which flowed into the lake, and the lake is our region's water supply source. The water comes from structures offshore on the lake called intake cribs. This is the City of Chicago Department of Water Management water intake crib today. This is the Deaver crib, which is just north of Navy Pier and a couple miles offshore. Um, again, it's not a water reclamation district facility, but it is part of our story here. And I also thought people who lived in Chicago and have only seen them from a distance might be uh, curious to see one up close. So there it is. Even with the sewer system helping to provide drainage, flooding was still a problem in the city. Just west of the city is a watershed boundary. And all that is is a high point in the landscape where water flows downhill on either side of it because water likes to flow downhill. I deliberately exaggerated the topography here. We obviously don't have hills anything like this in the Chicago region, but there is a hill there and I'll actually show it to you in a minute. The watershed boundary just west of Chicago actually divides two major North American watersheds. The Great Lakes watershed, which drains north to the Atlantic Ocean up the St. Lawrence River, and the Mississippi River watershed, which drains south to the Gulf of Mexico. So Chicago sits kind of right on the line between those two watersheds. All right, I said I'd show you that hill, though, that watershed boundary hill. In some areas, it's barely perceptible. In other places, you can actually find a hill. One spot where you can see it is at Ridgeland Avenue and North Avenue. So you can see here, North Avenue goes from an elevation of 620 up to 641 and then back down to 635 over the course of a few blocks. So there's a little hill there. Here's what that spot looks like. You can see there actually is a little bit of a hill here. We're looking down North Avenue to the east toward Lake Michigan. So historically, a raindrop that fell where we are now would theoretically flow down this hill into Lake Michigan and ultimately drain out the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic Ocean. While another raindrop that landed a couple blocks to the west of us would go to the Des Plaines River, the Mississippi River, and flow out into the Gulf of Mexico about 2,000 miles away from that first raindrop. Okay, now we understand the landscape. Let's recap the situation here. We have flooding in the city due to poor drainage, even though that sewer system was helping and they actually raised some portions of the city up to try to create more separation between the landscape and the river. Still, flooding was a problem. There was also the problem of that polluted water from the river threatening the region's water intakes on the lake. The Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, originally called the Sanitary District of Chicago, was founded in 1889 to reverse the flow of the Chicago River, to provide drainage for the Chicago region, and to protect the lake from pollution. We did that by excavating a canal across the watershed boundary, connecting the south branch of the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River at a lower point in the landscape in uh, Lockport, Illinois. So you can see here how the river now flows downhill away from the lake through the canal to the Des Plaines River. This downhill slope helped to provide drainage for the region and reversing the flow of the polluted river away from the lake protected the lake from pollution. So there you go. If any of you ever have to reverse the flow of a river, now you uh, know how it's done. This map shows the original configuration of the rivers with the Calumet rivers and Chicago rivers flowing out into Lake Michigan and the Des Plaines River on the other side of that watershed divide. And here's how the waterways look today. The Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal is the canal that reversed the flow of the Chicago River. You can see it cutting across the watershed divide there in the center. 
The North Shore Channel provides drainage for the north area, and it was actually originally designed to also add extra water for dilution to the river system. You'll recall the sewers were emptying straight into the river, so at the time it was a good idea to add extra water to the river to uh, help with that dilution. Together, these canals and portions of the natural rivers make up the 76-mile Chicago area waterway system. It wasn't as simple as just moving some dirt out of the way to excavate the canal through that watershed divide. There's actually a layer of limestone close to the surface in our area. This is 425 million year old Silurian limestone that dates to a period when Chicago was actually a tropical reef. We'll actually come back to this rock formation in a little bit and I'll show you some fossils. So to cut through the rock, we used explosives to break it up and then we used cantilevered cranes to lift the rock up out of the channel. At the time, this was the largest canal in the world. Nothing like this had ever been attempted. And our chief engineer on this project went on to work on the Panama Canal a few years later. This uh, photo is one of over 10,000 glass plate negatives that we have that document some of our early work. Over the past few years, we've been in the process of making high quality, high resolution scans of these glass plates. You can see they're about five by eight inches. So in addition to being historically significant, they also just contain an incredible amount of detail. I have a kind of funny story about that actually. When we first got our new scanner a few years ago, I grabbed this plate, which is a view of the south branch of the Chicago River on November 11th, 1904. You can see the date in the lower left corner there. Anyway, I grabbed this plate to do a test scan. And after I did the scan, I was looking at it in Photoshop up close to check out the image quality and resolution. And I noticed this guy standing by the river in the middle of the picture here. So let's zoom in on him here and tell me what you think. I, I don't know. To me, it really looks like this guy is taking a bathroom break from his job at the wagon wheel factory here. I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. First of all, it illustrates the incredible amount of detail in these photos. But second, this guy is providing an excellent demonstration for us of the prevailing method of dealing with sanitary sewage at the time, which was to put it in the river and dilute it. Here's another one of our historical photos. I want you to see if you can find the horse in this image. This picture has an incredible amount of detail I use a pretty nice Nikon camera for work, and I can't get anywhere near the amount of detail that's present in this uh, image from 1896. This is work on the controlling works at the downstream end of the canal. Okay, let's look a little bit closer. The horse is in this area. If you've already found the horse, see if you can find the guy sitting kind of right in the middle of the picture in the shade. The picture was taken on July 30th, 1896, so maybe it was a, a hot day. All right, the horse is up here. Let's zoom in and take a look. Isn't that incredible to see how small the horse is in the context of the whole image? If you're interested in our historical photos, we post them regularly on social media, so look us up. Water was turned into the newly completed canal on January 2nd, 1900. In this photo, you can see water flowing from the Chicago River over a temporary dam down into the canal. This is the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal today. This is a view looking northeast toward downtown. That's I-55 running alongside it here. Here's the North Shore Channel. This is a view looking south over the Dempster Street Bridge. The Water Reclamation District owns the right-of-way along the canal system, and we make over 8,000 acres of property available to surrounding communities for use as parkland and green space. And you can see here there's just miles and miles of parks along the North Shore Channel. This is a pretty neat view. There's, there's kind of a lot going on here. We're looking northeast. This is the confluence of the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal and the Calumet Sag Channel and you can see the Des Plaines River off to the left here. That bridge across the Sanitary and Ship Canal is Route 83. The structure in the middle of the picture here is a side stream elevated pool aeration station. We like to use acronyms around here, so we call them SEPA stations. This is one of five SEPA stations on the Calumet River system. 
This is SEPA 3 in Blue Island near the Western Avenue Bridge. This um, video clip, I think, is the high point of my career as a drone videographer, so I had to include it in the tour. The SEPA stations work by pumping water up out of the channel into a pool and then letting it flow over an artificial waterfall structure, which aerates it, increasing dissolved oxygen in the water. You can see here SEPA 3 has a great park surrounding it. This view also shows some more of that over 8,000 acres of property that we make available to the public for use as green space and parks. On the left side here, you could see a little bit of Centennial Trail, which is a great bike path that runs parallel to the Sanitary and Ship Canal for many miles. Over on the other side, a little bit further back, you can see where the CalSAG Trail begins, which is another great bike path that runs along the uh, Calumet SAG channel. That little canal just to the right of the Sanitary and Ship Canal is the INM Canal. The INM Canal was a small navigation canal that predated the Sanitary and Ship Canal. It was decommissioned and filled in in the city, but there are portions of it that are still visible, including here. This is our Lockport Powerhouse, which is at the downstream end of the waterway system. This is an interesting view here because you can really clearly see the 37-foot elevation difference between the waterway system on the right and the Des Plaines River on the left. We use that difference in elevation to generate hydroelectricity at the Lockport Powerhouse, which has been in operation since 1907. It was the first hydroelectric plant in Illinois. These are some of the older generators that are no longer in use. They've been replaced by new high efficiency ones that you can see kind of by the back wall in this view. We sell the hydroelectricity that we generate here back to the electric grid and we make on average a million dollars a year doing that. In this view, you can see a barge starting to make its way up the sanitary and ship canal from Lockport. Because the waterway system flows through a lot of the Chicago region, it provides an opportunity to use barges to deliver cargo. Barges are an economically and environmentally sound way to transport bulk materials. One barge can carry the equivalent dry cargo of 70 trucks or the liquid cargo of 144 trucks. That's a lot of trucks to have off the road, so each barge is kind of like a giant convoy of trucks. Barges also use way less fuel per ton of cargo than trucks or trains, which means a smaller carbon footprint and less of an impact on air quality in our area. So in a way, you, you could say that the waterway system helps with air quality and it helps reduce traffic congestion too. The waterway system worked great. It protected the lake from pollution and it provided drainage for the region and that allowed the city to keep growing. By 1910, Chicago had a population of 2 million. As we look at this panorama of Chicago in 1910 though, I want you to remember that sewer system I described to you earlier. At this time, every single one of these thousands and thousands of buildings was connected to a sewer that was emptying raw sewage straight into the river. Or in some cases, there were some that actually went to the lake at the time, but the majority were going right into the river. We also had our buddy at the wagon wheel factory uh, somewhere on the south branch here uh, doing his thing. So you can imagine water quality in the river was a problem. This is the 39th Street sewer, which served a portion of the south side of the city, including part of Union Stockyards, which is a huge slaughterhouse operation at the time. It emptied directly into Bubbly Creek, which is a small tributary of the south branch of the Chicago River. Bubbly Creek is still there today. You can find it at about 35th and Ashland. Actually, the CTA Orange Line Ashland stop is right on top of it. Here's another view of Bubbly Creek. So this is the result of the sewers emptying directly into waterways. For contrast, here's a picture of Bubbly Creek I took recently. The big difference is that today, the sewage that used to go straight into the river is now directed to our treatment plants where that water is clean before it's released to the river. Wastewater treatment technology didn't exist in the early 20th century, so the Water Reclamation District built pilot plants all across our service area where we tested out different methods of treating wastewater. We redirected some of the water from the sewer outfalls into our pilot plants and we figured out what worked and what didn't. 
In our archives, we have lots of technical reports of these investigations. Um, this is an example of part of a table from one of them from 1917. You can see all the different parameters they're measuring here in their investigation. Once the technology was in place and we began building treatment plants, we also had to get the water to our plants to be cleaned. To do that, we build a system of intercepting sewers that intercept the flow of the sewage before it reaches the river and carry it to our plants. One thing to note while we're looking at this illustration is that these local municipal sewers, which are kind of like the smaller neighborhood sewers, are owned and maintained by the individual municipalities, and they flow into the larger water reclamation district intercepting sewers. Here's some views of intercepting sewer construction. Um, as you can see, the, these are quite large. Our largest interceptor is actually 27 feet in diameter. In some places, the sewers had to be excavated through clay, which was difficult, messy work that had to be done by hand. Today, we have seven wastewater treatment plants and hundreds of miles of sewers. We clean an average of 1.5 billion gallons of water a day. Our Stickney plant is our largest plant, and it's actually the largest sewage treatment plant in the world. It's kind of hard to get a sense of scale looking at this picture, which I took from at about 1,200 feet from a helicopter. But um, if you look in the lower left corner, you can see the parking lot and all of those little specks in the parking lot are, of course, cars. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of size here. It's 413 acres. And maybe more significant than just the sheer area it takes up is what it can do. We can clean 1 million gallons of sewage a minute at our Stickney plant. I'm gonna walk you through the wastewater treatment process in a second, but before I do that, I wanna start a demonstration here. I have a glass of beautiful clean water here. I'm gonna add some dirt to it. This is just dirt from my garden. Stir it up. This is kind of what the water is like when it comes to our plants. There's a lot of suspended solids in the water, a lot of debris in it. I will remove 70 to 80 percent of the dirt from this water without using any filters or anything and I'll show you that uh, we'll, we'll pick it up again at the end of the tour. We're at the head of our Stickney plant where the sewers flow into the facility. You can see two intercepting sewers here. This is the eight foot Salt Creek interceptor and next to my head here is west side number one which is a 17 foot sewer that goes all the way from downtown Chicago along the river out to the Stickney plant. This is an example of a place you would never get to see in an in-person tour. Um, so enjoy the view. We're about 45 feet underground here. The sewers have been flowing to the plant by gravity. And just past us here, we pump the water up to the surface so it can be cleaned in the plant. Before we let the water go to the pumps, we need to remove any large debris that could cause damage. To do this, we send it through what are called coarse screens, which you see here. They're basically like metal fences that catch any large junk that somehow got washed down the sewer system. These are actually the screens at our O'Brien plant. The screens catch lots of flushable wipes, litter, and leaves in the fall. Over the years, we've removed some uh, more interesting things too. We sometimes get car wheels, probably somehow washed down a storm drain. We've received more than one bowling ball at our plants, and we also see uh, little super balls. One time a few years ago, we found two live opossums, and we were able to safely remove them, and they lived happily ever after on the grounds of the plant. Finally, people ask, yes, occasionally we do even find money. Once we've removed the large debris and uh, bowling balls and stuff, the water flows onto the pumps. We're in the pump and blower building at our Stickney plant, and you can see the pumps are well below ground level here. They're down at the elevation of the sewers that are coming into the plant. Behind my head here, these boxes are acoustic enclosures that hold blowers that we use for another part of the plant process that I'll show you in a minute. These blowers are super loud, so they're in these acoustic boxes to sort of reduce the ridiculous amount of noise. The blowers actually account for 50% of our energy use at the plant, which is uh, pretty interesting. I, I would have thought it was the water that would use the most energy, like pumping the water up, 
but it's actually the blowers. And that also gives you a sense of how important air is for our process. This is inside one of the blowers. Uh, they had disassembled it, and I thought this looked cool. It's like a jet engine turbine. After the water is pumped up to the surface, it flows through the rest of the plant by gravity, kind of like a river. The first step after the pumps is aerated grit tanks, where we use some of that air from the blowers to help rocks, sand, and gravel sink to the bottom. This is an aerated grit tank at our O'Brien plant. These boards on chains that you can see here go along the bottom of the tank and scrape that material out an opening in the bottom of the tank. And we want to remove this stuff early in the process because rocks and sand and gravel can be abrasive and damage the rest of the plant. Next, the water flows into primary tanks. And in primary tanks, we let the water sit very still. You can see these boards are moving very slowly across the top surface of the water here. And what they're doing is they're scraping anything that's floated to the surface, which is usually a mix of fats, oils, grease, and plastic. And uh, they scrape it to the end of the tank, and that's disposed of in a dumpster. Meanwhile, underwater, the organic solids mixed in with the wastewater are sinking to the bottom. And those are removed at this stage and go through a separate solids process. We're actually able to remove 70 to 80% of the solids from the water in primary treatment. So this water has already improved quite a bit. And I want you to notice how clear this is here. You can definitely see there's some uh, debris mixed in with it, but it's uh, significantly cleaner and it actually looks pretty clear here. And that'll be important in a second. After primary treatment, the water flows on to secondary treatment. Secondary treatment consists of two parts. We have secondary aeration tanks and final settling tanks. The aeration tanks work just like a fish aquarium where you have air bubbles going into the water. And uh, you do that to add dissolved oxygen to the water for the fish to breathe with their gills. In the case of our aeration tanks, we are adding dissolved oxygen to the water to make the conditions just right for beneficial bacteria that help us clean the water. So this is where that air from the blowers back at the pump and blower building is ending up. Most of it's used in these aeration tanks. We have 36 acres of aeration tanks at our Stickney plant. And uh, these are four pass tanks, so the water zigzags back and forth through them. Now in order to explain the process that's happening in these aeration tanks, I'm going to have to show you a highly technical diagram. So bear with me, I will explain this. All right, here it is. This is the water coming into the aeration tanks from primary treatment. So you can see that there's some suspended solids which are depicted as the little chunks here. And there's also dissolved solids, which is the sort of general background color. In addition to that, we have a mix of microbes, of microorganisms in the wastewater. And that includes harmless, beneficial bacteria, as well as pathogens or germs that can cause illness. And I'll let you uh, figure out which is which in the symbology here. So when this water enters the aeration tanks, we add those air bubbles, and that increases the dissolved oxygen in the water. The beneficial bacteria tend to be aerobic organisms, meaning they thrive in the presence of oxygen. So as the dissolved oxygen in the water increases, they become active and they start swimming around and consuming the solids in the water, both the suspended and dissolved solids in the water. So the water is getting a little bit cleaner as it flows through the aeration tank, and the beneficial bacteria are getting more and more numerous. Meanwhile, the pathogens, the disease-causing organisms, tend to be anaerobic, meaning they thrive in the absence of oxygen, and in fact, in some cases, oxygen is actually poisonous to them. They're also getting outcompeted for food. You see we've got lots of the good guys here, and they've eaten up pretty much all of the pollution from the water, so there's not too much left for the pathogens to eat. And so we actually see them die off in the process. And we confirm that this is happening in our microbiology lab. So now the beneficial bacteria have consumed the pollutants in the water. But if you looked at this water here in a glass, it would be very cloudy because they're still suspended. They're still dispersed throughout the water. The bacteria that we select for for our treatment process have a behavior called flocculation. And what that means is when they run out of food, they go into a dormant state and form clumps. Now these clumps are actually able to sink and settle to the bottom of a tank. 
And that's what happens in those final settling tanks. The water flows into them from the aeration tanks, and these flock particles are able to sink to the bottom. From here, we let just the top inch or so of water flow out of the final settling tank. And meanwhile, about 95% of the bacteria and microbes that have settled to the bottom in those flock particles are sent back around to the beginning of the aeration tanks to work again. And the, that remaining uh, 5% is sent to the separate solids process that I'll talk about in a minute. All right, I think uh, we've been looking at these acres and acres of churning sewage for a while, and I know what you're thinking. You're wishing that someone would put a GoPro camera underwater here so you could get an underwater view of this process. Well, I uh, anticipated that and rigged a GoPro up in a, inside a glass sample jar and attached it to a piece of PVC pipe so we could take a look at it. So let's check that out. All right, here's what our trusty GoPro saw as it went underwater in an aeration tank. The interesting thing about this is that it's actually not great video because the water is so opaque, the camera can't see through it. But if you think back to the water coming out of the step before from primary treatment, remember I pointed out how uh, transparent it was. So why is the water in the next step of the process more opaque? Well, it's because we have a thriving population of those uh, smiley face emoji beneficial bacteria that are working to clean the water here. So we've saturated the water with treatment microbes to efficiently clean it, and that's why you can't see through it. A GoPro is one way to find out what's happening with the water in our plants. Uh, we generally take a more scientific approach, though, and conduct rigorous laboratory analyses at all stages of our process. We actually even monitor and regulate the water upstream of our facilities that's coming from industrial dischargers before that water even goes into the sewer system. The water that leaves our plants and flows into the waterways has to meet strict requirements that are defined in permits that we hold with the state of Illinois. So at the end of our process, we're continually checking a number of parameters to make sure that we're meeting all of the requirements of our permits. In our microbiology lab, we can actually check up on those microbes that are so important for our treatment process. And the population that we see under the microscope can actually tell us a lot about how the plant is operating. Here's the bacteria. You can see they're moving around here. So they're in their smiley face active mode. There's uh, plenty of dissolved oxygen and plenty of food. So they're just happily swimming around and uh, consuming the pollutants out of the water. Bacteria make up over 95% of the microbes in our aeration tanks, but some of the other organisms can give us indications about what's happening in the process. For example, this is an amoeba. You can see uh, it moves very slowly, and in fact, uh, they eat by just engulfing readily available food in the water. So they do well early in the process when there's still plenty of food, plenty of uh, pollution in the water. And then as that water flows through the aeration tank and our beneficial bacteria have had a chance to remove more and more of the pollutants, the conditions become less favorable for amoebas. This is a flagellate. You can see it moves a lot faster than the amoeba, but they reproduce a lot slower than our beneficial bacteria. So they tend to get outnumbered and outcompeted as the water flows through the aeration tank. If we see a lot of amoebas and flagellates at the end of the aeration tank, it's a sign that something might be out of whack. As we start to get a good population of bacteria in the aeration tank, a food chain develops with higher organisms, such as this free-swimming ciliate, that feed on that bacteria. Uh, the term ciliate comes from the Latin word for eyelash, and you can see it has these eyelash-like structures that it's using to swim around and actually also to feed. Free swimming ciliates feed on dispersed bacteria that's still suspended in the water. So when we see them, it's an indication that there's a lot of dispersed bacteria in the water. In order to effectively clean the water, we're looking for that bacteria to start going dormant and form those flock particles toward the end of the aeration tanks. And once that happens, we start to see a different mix of higher organisms that feed on them such as these crawling ciliates, which uh, you can see them here eating their favorite meal of delicious dormant bacteria. 
when we have good flock particle formation, we also start to see stalked ciliates, which have a stem that attaches to the flock particle and a head-like structure with cilia on the top. And they use that to sweep in and feed on any remaining dispersed bacteria in the water. So they kind of do some additional cleanup work in the water for us. Both the crawling ciliates and the stalked ciliates are indicators that we've got good flock particles and the process is working well. One of the top predators in our aeration tank food chain is the tardigrade or water bear. They have four pairs of legs and they prowl around the tank looking for uh, unsuspecting protozoa to devour. Water bears are sensitive to ammonia, which is one of the parameters that's defined in our permits. So they're actually a good indication that we're doing well uh, in regard to ammonia. In addition to that, they are by far the best dancers of any of the microbes in our treatment process. After the aeration tanks, the water flows into final settling tanks. And this is where we let those flock particles settle to the bottom and we let just the top inch or so of water flow out of the tank. The water enters from the aeration tanks in this structure in the center, and you can see there's a difference in color between these two areas. And that's because the water coming in from the aeration tank is all stirred up, so the particles haven't had a chance to sink yet. So this uh, dark water here just looks dark because you're seeing down into this deep tank. There's a sort of granular uh, sandy appearance to the particles and that's exactly what we want to see. We want to see good clear separation and clearly defined particles here. If we look at it underwater you can see it even better. Here we have some great flocculation on this side and on this side we have crystal clear water between the particles. So all we got to do at this point is wait for them to settle to the bottom and we've got clear water. For this biological process to work, to clean the water so that we can meet the requirements of our permits, we have to keep that bacteria happy and healthy. And we need to set up the plant so that we can make the most of the work that it's doing. We've got three main controls we can use to do this. First, we can control how quickly the water is flowing through the aeration tanks. The water flows through the aeration tanks like a river, and ideally we want the flock particles to be forming right at the end of the aeration tanks. If the particles form too early and the bacteria goes dormant too early, it can actually start to die off before it gets to the final settling tanks. And when that happens, the particles break up and we don't have clean water. On the flip side, if the water is flowing through the tank too quickly, the bacteria might not have time to consume all the pollutants in the water, or it might not have time to go dormant and form those flock particles. So it's gotta be going through at just the right speed. We can also control the amount of air going into the aeration tanks. The bacteria are aerobic organisms, so if we add more air, it tends to make them more active. The last main control we have is the amount of bacteria we're sending back from those final settling tanks. I said it was 95% a minute ago. It's actually, that's sort of an average figure. We're actually continually adjusting that to optimize the process. So these are the three big controls we have to uh, effectively use bacteria to clean water. At our O'Brien plant, our permit requires us to disinfect the water before it leaves the plant during certain months when there's likely to be recreation on the river. We accomplish this by sending the water through these arrays of super powerful ultraviolet light bulbs that you can see here. The UV light deactivates any microbes left in the water after those final settling tanks. At our Calumet plant, we accomplish the same thing using a chlorination dechlorination process. In that process, we add chlorine to the water and then send it through this uh, crazy maze-like structure. And then at the end of that, we chemically remove the chlorine before letting the water out into the river. The solids we remove from the water go to anaerobic digesters where there's a whole other biological process that breaks them down and produces biogas that we use to heat and cool our plants. After the digesters, the solids are designated by the US EPA to be biosolids. And the biosolids undergo additional processing, including centrifuges, which work like the spin cycle of a washing machine and air drying at our solids management areas. 
the solids management area near our Stickney plant is about seven miles away. And one way that we transport the biosolids from Stickney to that place is using our own train line. Just like the water we release from our plants, our biosolids are also subject to strict standards for quality. So they're also continually tested to confirm we're meeting those standards. We blend biosolids with wood chips to produce a premium compost product. Our compost and biosolids are used for landscaping throughout the region. One uh, really cool location that used our biosolids is Maggie Daly Park in downtown Chicago. So that's our treatment process. If you thought that seemed like a great subject for a children's book, we agree with you. Our book, Where Does It Go? is available on our website, mwrd.org. All right, we're gonna move on now to the tunnel and reservoir plan or deep tunnel. Sewer systems that are designed to carry both sanitary sewage and rainwater in the same set of pipes are called combined sewers. The Chicago sewer system that I talked about earlier is a combined sewer system. You'll remember that it was originally designed to flow straight into the waterways, and we built our intercepting sewers to catch that water and bring it to our plants so the water can be cleaned. There's another type of sewer system called a separate sewer system where storm sewers empty straight into waterways and sanitary sewers go through a separate sanitary sewer that connects to intercepting sewers, which flow to treatment plants. In our service area, we have 375 square miles that are served by combined sewer systems and 508.5 square miles that have separate sewers or no sewers. Now the tunnel and reservoir plan or deep tunnel is designed specifically for the combined sewer areas. And here's why. Under normal conditions, the intercepting sewer is able to carry rainwater and the sanitary sewage to our plants to be cleaned. But when we get really heavy rainfall, it adds a lot of extra water to the system and we can get more water coming into our plants than can be cleaned. Heavy rains can also overwhelm the capacity of the sewer system to transport the water to the plants. When this happens, the sewer follows its original course and overflows to the waterways. This is called a combined sewer overflow. This is bad for a couple reasons. First of all, it's polluting the river. Second, it's adding more water to the rivers, which could increase the risk of flooding. By the 1950s, we were seeing combined sewer overflows about 100 days a year, and the water reclamation districts joined with the state of Illinois, the city of Chicago, and Cook County to form a flood control coordinating committee to look at solutions to this problem. The solution we arrived at is the tunnel and reservoir plan, which is a system of huge tunnels, hundreds of feet below ground, that catch the water that would otherwise overflow to the river and carry it to gigantic reservoirs. This water is held in the system until the treatment plants have a chance to catch up after the rainstorm, and then is pumped back to the plants and fully treated before being released to the river. There are four tunnel systems that follow the course of the rivers they protect. They're connected to the sewer system with what are called drop shafts, and they flow to three huge reservoirs. This is what a tarp drop shaft looks like at the surface. This is at Michigan Avenue downtown. A drop shaft is just a big hole that connects the sewers to the deep tunnel system. They're divided in half, so water goes down one side and air is able to escape out the other side. And that's important because we don't want air to get trapped in the tunnel system because it can cause problems. All right, now you know how it works. Let's uh, go check out some tunnels. When I go to the tarp tunnels, I'm going there to shoot photos and video to document construction work. And to get into the tunnels, we're lowered down a 300 foot deep access shaft by crane inside a metal cage. Construction began on the tarp tunnels in 1975. The project was planned so that portions of it could come online as they were completed. So the Upper Des Plaines tunnel system was completed and online in 1981, and the overall tunnel system was completed and operational in 2006. Today we'll be seeing work on shorter connecting tunnels that were being built to connect the existing tunnel system to the reservoirs. I want to give you an idea of what it's like to be lowered by crane down one of these access shafts. Um, this time I put my phone on the floor of the cage and got this Pretty cool view looking straight down here. That's the floor of the Des Plaines connecting tunnel you can see there below us. 
The water you see here is just seepage and actually I think it's some rainwater. It was raining the day I shot this video. This again is not a live tunnel, this is a tunnel under construction. So you can imagine it, it's about 55 degrees year round in the tunnels. So if you go there in the summer, you need to bring a sweatshirt or something to keep warm. And if you go there in the winter, I can say from experience, it's a big mistake to wear a heavy winter coat while you're trying to carry um, heavy video and photo equipment around in the tunnels. This is the point where the McCook connecting tunnel connects to the mainstream tunnel. In a minute, I'll show you a time lapse of about 3.5 billion gallons of combined sewage flowing out of this tunnel into McCook Reservoir. This is excavation of the Des Plaines connecting tunnel. You can see they're using a laser to guide the work. This rock is the same Silurian limestone formation that the Sanitarian Ship Canal was excavated through in the late 1800s. Now we're inside a movable concrete liner form. The tunnels are excavated through the rock and then afterwards we pour a concrete liner using this form which can be moved so it can be done in sections. The liner helps seal the tunnels and provides a smooth interior surface. This is what a lined tarp tunnel looks like. We have 110 miles of tarp tunnels with a capacity of 2.4 billion gallons. Our tunnels are as large as 33 feet in diameter. Sometimes the access shaft is far from the work location, so these guys are actually getting a ride to their job site here. We were testing out flying a small drone in the tunnel, which is what they're looking at here. The drone didn't work out too well. There's no GPS signal 300 feet underground, and it was uh, hard to keep it stable. I recently had a VHS tape about TARP from the 1980s from our engineering archive digitized and uh, it includes some incredible video of construction on the project and as a bonus it features a great soundtrack. What you see here is a tunnel boring machine. We used these to excavate the longer reaches of the tunnel system. They're way more efficient than the previous method of excavating a tunnel in rock, which was to drill holes, put explosives in, get everyone out of the way, set off the explosives, and then uh, send people in to remove the rock and then repeat the process. Today, they're pretty much the standard method of excavating a long tunnel in rock, but at the time, they were new technology and they were first used at scale on our tunnel and reservoir plan. Tunnel boring machines are able to cut through rock continually. The rock that's broken loose by the cutting head at the front of the machine is carted out the back of the machine. So that's how we excavated this huge system of tunnels. Now I'm gonna show you how we're excavating the gigantic reservoirs that the tunnels flow into. We're at our Thornton Reservoir, and this is when it was under construction a couple of years ago. It's actually online today. Um, this is about a hundred foot high rock face here, and this outcropping is 36,000 tons of limestone that had to be excavated that day. So uh, as you may have guessed, we have now come to the huge explosion part of the tour. So uh, enjoy. Actually, um, when I was practicing this virtual tour, I ran through it with my son, my 11-year-old son, and the one bit of advice he gave me on how I could improve my presentation overall was that at this part, I really should do this. All right, there, took care of that. I, I think that improved it. We partnered with commercial quarry operators to excavate the large tarp reservoirs. This is a great way to get a project of this scale done economically because they have a use for a vast amount of rock and we want the hole in the ground after the rock has been removed. So it's a win-win. To give you a sense of scale here, these dump trucks hold 150 tons each. Our McCook Reservoir is being completed in two stages. Stage one is in operation now and stage two in the foreground here is uh, being excavated. When it's complete, McCook Reservoir will have a capacity of 10 billion gallons and will be about a mile long. 
For something of this scale, you can see how it really makes sense to plan the project so that parts of it can be put into operation as they're completed rather than waiting for the whole thing to be done. This is stage one of McCook Reservoir in the foreground here. It has a capacity of 3.5 billion gallons and it's been in operation since 2017. That's the Sanitarian Ship Canal on the left and I-55 and the Des Plaines River on the right. We're about to see water flow into McCook Reservoir for the first time. This is from January 2018. Uh, that's a 33 foot diameter tunnel there and these concrete blocks are there to diffuse the kinetic energy of the water coming out of the tunnel and you'll see in a second I'll flash forward a little bit in time and you can see the water is coming out pretty quickly. These are solar powered aerators which we have at our tarp reservoirs to help reduce odors by increasing dissolved oxygen in the top surface of the water in the reservoir and that creates kind of a barrier that reduces odor. At uh, McCook, the aerators are anchored to these large towers that you see here. There's a gate structure about a quarter mile up the tunnel that we can use to isolate the reservoir from the tunnel system. Normally those gates are kept open, but on this day they were closed and there was water in the tunnel, so we were able to coordinate to document this historic moment. To me, this is kind of like an updated version of that photo I showed you earlier of water flowing into the sanitary and ship canal for the first time. This is a time lapse of McCook Reservoir filling over the course of about 24 hours. That's that same 33 foot diameter uh, tunnel. You can see there's a little bit of water in it to begin with, but it'll fill up pretty quickly here overnight. This is 3.5 billion gallons of combined sewage that would have otherwise ended up in the river that's now going to be pumped back to our Stickney plant and treated before it's released. Thornton Reservoir is connected to the Calumet tunnel system. It has a capacity of 7.9 billion gallons. That's I-80 you can see running along the south wall of the reservoir here. You can also see the floating solar powered aerators on the surface of the water. While we're hovering 400 feet over Thornton Reservoir, I'm gonna show you some fossils. Both Thornton and McCook Reservoir were excavated from that 425 million year old Silurian limestone that dates back to when all of this was a tropical reef. So we find stuff like this there. This is a crinoid. It has a, a modern descendant called a sea lily. So if you, uh, if you look that up, you can see kind of what it must have looked like. I also found this some kind of shellfish, like a, a clam-like organism. I'm by no means an expert on this stuff. Uh, one of our engineers at the field office during construction at Thornton actually collected fossils and his desk became like a little mini natural history museum, which was pretty cool to see. The tunnel and reservoir plan is such a huge project, it's kind of hard to describe its scale. When it's complete, it will have a capacity of 17.5 billion gallons. A rain barrel holds 55 gallons, so the capacity of tarp would fill over 318 million rain barrels. And if we put those end on end, they'd circle the earth over seven times. I've been listing all these huge numbers for a while now, and I think it's reasonable for people to ask, but is it working? First of all, we've seen the number of combined sewer overflows decrease dramatically, first when the tunnels went online, and then more recently as the larger reservoirs have come online. We also have detailed water quality data going back decades that we can look at to see trends in improvement in water quality. The Chicago River system is one of the most scientifically studied rivers in the world, thanks to the work of the Water Reclamation District. This is one of our field technicians removing a water quality sampling device from the main stem of the Chicago River. We collect water quality data at locations throughout the region, and a lot of that's available in an interactive online mapping tool that you can navigate to via our website, mwrd.org, if you want to nerd out on water quality information. Another indication of the success of the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan is the number of cities around the world that are building similar deep tunnel systems to address combined sewer overflows. This is technology that was designed and developed for the Chicago region that's now protecting rivers all around the world. In addition to collecting data about the water itself, you can also learn a lot about the health of a river system by looking at what lives in it. And we do that in our biological monitoring program. 
This is one of our research boats on the south branch of the Chicago River. We use electrofishing to collect data on the fish population. This is one of our biologists driving the electrofishing boat. The electrofishing boat has two anodes in front that electrically charge the water around it. That stuns the fish in the water. It doesn't kill them, it just stuns them, and they float to the surface. The two field technicians at the front of the boat scoop the fish up with nets and put them in wet wells. The fish are brought to the larger research boat where they're weighed, measured, and identified before being returned to the river. We have fish data going back to the 1970s and it's pretty incredible to see how much things have changed since then. If you look at one sampling location, for example, uh, at Tui Avenue on the North Shore Channel, back in the early 70s we would fish there for an hour and catch five fish. Today we go to the same location and we regularly catch around 300 fish. You can find a lot of our fish data in that online water quality mapping tool which you can navigate to via our website mwrd.org. As the Stormwater Management Authority for Cook County, we have projects all across the region. These include huge flood control reservoirs, stream bank stabilization projects, and green infrastructure. In the Space to Grow partnership, we fund rebuilding Chicago Public School schoolyards with green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is a range of technologies that hold rainwater where it falls, so less of it enters the waterways and the sewer system, which can help reduce the risk of flooding and improve water quality. This is a before photo of Davis Elementary School in Chicago, and you can see there's traffic cones out in front of the school there and some standing water. That's an indication that there's not great drainage here, so when it rains, there's probably a lot of runoff coming from this schoolyard into the sewer system. So this schoolyard isn't great from a stormwater perspective. It's also not great from the perspective of the students at the school. This is their uh, playground. What's really cool about the Space to Grow partnership is the schoolyards are rebuilt from both a stormwater perspective and a student perspective. So here's Davis Elementary School after. These are native plants in the foreground and pervious surfaces that are designed to absorb rainwater. We've completed 25 of these Space to Grow schools and they have a capacity to hold 4.4 million gallons of rainwater that otherwise would have ended up in the sewer system. Space to Grow also has an educational component. These students are planting native plants on the grounds of their school. We do big green infrastructure projects in partnerships like Space to Grow and in other partnerships with municipalities. But one cool thing about green infrastructure is that it's something that individuals can do on their own property to help reduce flooding and improve water quality. Our Green Neighbor Guide, which is available on our website, mwrd.org, has a lot of practical information on green infrastructure. Disconnecting downspouts is a super easy way to reduce the amount of water that a house is sending into the sewer system. If you've disconnected your downspout, you can save the water in a rain barrel for reuse. We sell rain barrels at our website, mwrd.org. Pervious pavement allows rainwater to infiltrate between the pavers into the ground rather than running off into the sewer system. This is a parking lot at our Stickney plant. Rain gardens are a type of landscaping that can hold 30% more water than grass. We actually have the largest rain garden in Illinois at our Stickney plant. This is a view of part of it with some native milkweed in the foreground here. Green roofs are a way to hold rainwater on the roof of a structure, and I think they look pretty cool too. Native plants soak up much more rainwater than grass. We actually have over 30 acres of native prairie landscaping at our facilities. This is our Egan plant here. We use native landscaping in our stormwater management projects too. This is a stream bank stabilization project on Addison Creek in North Lake. And you can see here it was planted with native grasses. We have over 150 job titles at the Water Reclamation District. If any of what I showed you was interesting to you or if you're uh, just looking for a job, I encourage you to go to our website, mwrd.org, and register your interest in a job category. We uh, have a civil service hiring process, so it's all exam based. So once you've registered your interest in a job type, you'll be notified when we're giving the exam. As a government agency, we're governed by an elected board of nine commissioners. Our board meets regularly. The meetings are open to the public and they're streamed on our website, mwrd.org.
www.ncpsafety.org. Our Board of Commissioners welcomes public involvement and they want to hear from their constituents, so get in touch with them or uh, attend a board meeting if you're interested. Well, we've made it to the end of the tour. I've been talking continuously for uh, just over an hour now and believe it or not, there's still a bunch of really cool stuff that I'm not gonna be able to get to, like this or this or these guys. Maybe I'll have to do a part two or something and I can explain what you just saw there. I didn't forget about that water from the beginning though. Remember I put dirt in this glass of water and I was gonna remove 70 to 80% of it without using a filter or anything. So you can see what happened here. The dirt sunk to the bottom. And uh, what I did was basically uh, some of that primary treatment where you let the water sit still and let whatever can sink to the bottom sink to the bottom. And then uh, to really complete the process, we would let this water flow off the top of the tank. And you've got some great separation between the solids and the water. That might have done better than 80% there, I'm not sure. Thank you for attending the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago's virtual tour. I hope it was interesting and informative. I wanna thank my colleagues in the MWRD Office of Public Affairs for their help on this project, especially Dan Went, who shot a bunch of the great photos and video that you just saw. If you need more information about anything, go to our website, mwrd.org. You can also email us at public.affairs at mwrd.org. If you wanna see what we're up to on a daily basis or uh, see those historical photos that we're posting, follow us on social media. All right, I wanna take one more crack at this.